Hi everyone, I'm Joshua Oro, the Mustang Prince. Welcome to Season 3 of Mustang Prince Oro Reports. Yeah, I'm sorry I haven't made any new blogs in about a while since my territory got cursed. It just, I've been a little bit busy with Christmas plans and also I was a bit heartbroken after losing one of my theater friends because of diabetes in his leg. Anyway, I promised I will blog Penguins of Madagascar this year. Besides, I think it'll be fair to blog it once it's on DVD anyway. But today, I'll be blogging another horse movie that influenced me. Now, you may remember when I did a blog on, on the two Unico films last September, I did say that those films did influence me to be called The Mustang Prince. But I kind of did forget to tell you that there was another animated horse movie that influenced me. You see, way back in the summer of 2007, I came across a beautiful film from the from 1980s on Netflix. And I was influenced by, um, shall we say one of my favorite reviewers to buy it from my local Target store in the autumn of 2011. Now, does it still hold up after all these years? Well, let's find out. Released on November 19th, 1982, the movie is... The Last Unicorn. Now... Let's start with the plot of this movie. From a real-speaking butterfly, a unicorn learns that she's supposedly the last of her kind. All the others have been hurried away by a red bull. The unicorn sets out to discover the truth behind the butterfly's words. She's eventually joined on her quest by Smendrick, a second-rate magician, and Molly Grew, a now middle-aged woman who dreams all her life of seeing a unicorn. Their journey leads them far from home, all the way to the castle of, of King Haggard. So, what are my personal thoughts on this movie? Well, I believe really it's a great film. Plus, it's one of my all-time favorites ever. But I'm still a little bit disappointed that I didn't see it when I was a child. Anyway, let's move on to Mustang Notes and... I'll explain some more. Peter S. Beagle stated that there had been interest in creating a film based on the book that he written, which was early on. Now, I hadn't really heard of a book until that time back in 2007, or, but still, Hopefully, if I do find that book somewhere in my local library, I might give it a read one day. Now, those who experienced interest included Lee Mend Mendelssohn and Bill, M Bill Melendez, through Beagle had been convinced by one of their partners' wives that they were not good enough for former 20th Century Fox animator Les Goldman. At the time, Beagle believed that animated was the only way to go with regard to the film and had never thought of making it into a live action film. Reagan Bass had been through the last been the last studio that the film's associate producer Michael Chase Walker approached and Beagle was horrified when he was informed that they made a deal with Walker. Beagle stated that he has come to feel that the film is actually a good deal more than I had ever created, so he says. And went on to say, There is some lovely design work. The Japanese artists who did the concepts and coloring were very good, and the voice actors do a superb job in bringing the characters to life. While Rankin and Bass provided the film's dialogue and story based on Beatles' work, the animation was done by the studio Topcraft, who, before this movie, made the 1977 Hobbit movie.
And before anyone asks, yes, I did enjoy Peter Jackson's Hobbit trilogy. Uh, those films are for another day. The studio was later hired by Japanese director Hayao Miyazaki to work on Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind. And their core members eventually went on to form Studio Ghibli. According to Beagle, the final film ended up being remarkably close to the original script. Although, one scene at the end involving an encounter with a princess was animated, but eventually cut out. Now, while the film is great, there are a few things that are kind of a bit mature for younger viewers. It's kind of mature for for younger viewers nowadays to see. Like, oh boy. There's like this harpy that has something that I'm kind of a little bit embarrassed and sick to mention. But you guys are, may already know what I'm talking about, though. And there's also a scene where Smendrick is tied to a tree. Now, those are kind of dirty for a G-rated film. Also, there are some romantic complications in it as well. Although the animation is awesome. I mean, it is top craft after all. While it is a mix of Japanese and, and American art, the animation makes the scene and landscapes look very beautiful. Almost like as if it was a painting come to life. And sometimes the animation could get a bit intense and dark when it comes to a well, when it comes to this terrifying beast known as the Red Bull. While its name may make people think of the energy drink of the same name, which I refuse to ever drink ever, though, just keep in mind that this monster is the scariest in the entire movie. I mean, it's a giant bull on fire! Oh, that also reminds me. <clears throat> As I said in my blog of Pan's Labyrinth last April, I did say that I was working on my own fantasy story based on my own life. And the Red Bull is a bit my inspiration for an evil monster that I'm making up, which is going to be named El Rosso. Also, this movie does have an interesting soundtrack. Like, three of the songs in the movie are sung by folk rock band America. The first one being the title song, The Last Unicorn, which is probably my favorite song in the whole movie. And it's like a, has a really smooth melody. Plus, I'll never forget that a couple of Decembers ago, when I actually sang that song for my voice class back at Saddleback College. Man's Road is pretty good, too. I mean, it's a really mysterious song, but it's kind of like a nice travel song as well. Also, In the Sea is not as good as the other songs. I mean, it's nice, but it's kind of softer. However, there are also two songs that are sung by the characters. First is Now That I'm a Woman, which is sung by Lady Amalthea. It's kind of like her saying like how she feels in her human form. And the other one is That's All I Gotta Say, which is sung by Prince Lear. It's a romantic song, which is very poetic and psychological. And... But my favorite part of that song is when... Amalthea sees her and Lear in a forest where she sees her former self from across a lake, and she does sing a reprise of Now There a Woman during that song as well. Now, let's talk about the characters of this movie. Now, our title character, the Unicorn, or Lady Amalthea in her human form, is voiced by Mia Farrow. who did act as Arthur's grandmother in the awful Arthur and the Invisibles trilogy. 
in the movie, she's in search of the, well, search for the other unicorns, and is later transformed to a young woman and learns about regret and love. I mean, in my eyes, the unicorn is the best character in the movie because of my love for anything that's horse-related. I also love her sweet and innocent personality. Smendrick the Magician is voiced by Alan Arkin. I mean, he accompanies the unicorn on her quest to find others like her. How, but Beagle commented that he was a bit disappointed by the way Alan Arkin approached the character because it seemed too flat. But anyway, I like Smendrick. I mean, he can be a bit funny at times, when his spells don't go the way he plans, but he knows when to be serious. Prince Lear is voiced by Jeff Bridges. Who, uh, during that same year, played Kevin Flynn in Disney's Tron. He's Haggard's adoptive son who falls in love with Lady Amalfia. Although he is later told by Smendrick that she is actually a unicorn, his feelings for her remain. And in my eyes, Jeff Bridges does a great job voicing and singing as this character. Molly Grew is voiced by Tammy Grimes. I mean, she starts out as the love for Captain Collie, who is well, voiced by Keenan Wynn, then later joins Smendrick and the Unicorn on their quest. While explaining that there was no particular reason that she that he did not write a detailed background for Molly Grew's character, Peter S. Beagle stated that, that he has always been grateful to Grimes because she brought such vocal to the character that she covered things that that I didn't do. Next we have Mummy Fortuna, voiced by the wonderful, talented Angela Lansbury. She's a witch who uses her illusionary magic to run a midnight carnival, which showcases mythical creatures that are in truth just normal animals, like a toothless lion being a manticore, an ape with a twisted foot into a satyr, and a snake being a dragon. She even puts a fake unicorn on the unicorn's head due to the fact that people can't see the a unicorn because of not believing in one. Later, the harpy Kalenio, also voiced by Keenan Wynn, one of the two real mythical creatures, kills her and her henchman Rook. Lastly, King Hagger is voiced by Christopher Lee, who has been in such films like Tim Burton's Corpse Bride, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, the Star Wars prequel trilogy, the Lord of the Rings trilogy, and the Hobbit trilogy, and also a lot of video game famers, a lot of video game fans might know Christopher Lee for voicing this character as well. <clears throat> anyway, Haggard is the ruler of a dreary kingdom who has never been happy, save for when he looks at unicorns. He uses the Red Bull to drive the other unicorns into the, into the sea. Beagle described Lee as the last of the great 19th century actors, and <clears throat> excuse me, either the most literate or second most literate performer he's ever met. When Lee came into work, he brought his own copy of the novel, wherein he took note of the lines that he had believed that were not omitted. Lee, who is fluent in German, also voiced King Haggard in the German dub of the movie as well. Which is pretty interesting, kind of like Vanessa Paradis doing the French dub of the monster in Paris. Anyway, the rest of the cast includes 
Robert Klein, Paul Fries, Don Messick, and Rita Bujoyas. Now let's end this off with my final words. Above all, The Last Unicorn is truly a masterpiece. And I'm glad this movie, along with the Unico movies, inspired me to be called the Mustang Prince. The animation and visuals are great, but sometimes a bit mature. The characters are all memorable, and the songs always give me goosebumps and tears, making me feel all relaxed and happy. With all that said, I give this film a rating of 98%. So, that's all I have to say about this wonderful movie. Sure to join me next time for my next blog. Mustang Power. Walking man's road Walking man